Uh, John Brito. Uh, John Brito. Hello. Other uh, John Brito. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Good morning, everyone. Thank you. thank you, sir. Thank you for joining us. Uh, yeah. Let's start our session. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm extremely delighted to start our international webinar series for. We, PG Department of Commerce, welcome you all for the second session of the webinar series. I request our Reverend Sister Dr. Santi Mary to lead us in prayer. Sister, please. Sister? A day without prayer is a day without blessing. And a life without prayer is a life without power. Almighty our loving Father, we wholeheartedly praise and thank you for this precious day. Thank you, Lord, for gathering all of us once again for the second session of this international webinar. We ask you to bless all our participants, especially our principal, vice principals, staff members, and head of the department, Reverend Father Dr. Adekila Sami. We also ask you to bless your blessings. We are going to enrich and enlighten all our young minds. Thank you, the Department of Commerce, 
who are willing to organize this program for the welfare of our students community bless them lord give them good health and mind and body so that they may be able to continue their service for the growth of whole humanity in this world for this we ask through christ our lord amen uh, we all heartedly thank our administrative sister for joining us thank you sister thank you so much now i invite our head of the department reverend father dr arikil sami to welcome our eminent speaker father please sir yes thank you sir on behalf of our founder reverend father j e arul raj our administrator reverend sister dr k sandhya to mary our principal dr ruben vice principals all the hods and staff members on behalf of our st joseph's college pg department of commerce i welcome our founder chairman for this international webinar series and all of our dft um, eminent personalities especially i welcome our administrator our sister dr k sandhya dr ruben our principal vice principals hods and all the staff members i am so happy to welcome and introduce reverend father jan brito he is from the diocese of vello and he hailed in the village of elayangani and he is ordained for the diocese of varanasi and now He is there in Austria. He did his Hindi literature from Agra University in Uttar Pradesh. After that, he finished his Master of English Literature from Janpur University, Uttar Pradesh. Our father, Reverend Father Brito, has done his theology from Saint Charles Seminary, Nagpur. and it was uh, affiliated from angelicum university rome then further he did his advanced research in masters in theology and religious studies from the catholic university of louvain belgium now presently father is doing his doctoral studies in theology from the university of vienna austria when i approached him he happily accepted our invitation and he is happy to deliver his speech on business ethics and uh, the the notion of justice today now during this pandemic period everywhere we can see the notion of money power and politics in america uh, recently we came across the uh, racism so uh, the whole world was fighting for them so if he asks if there is justice between the human beings it is a great question mark recently in tamil nadu also and uh, two and uh, shopkeeper and another the father and son was killed by the police people when when we speak about uh, ethics uh, moral in business it's a question mark when we speak about justice in the world it's a question mark so this is the right time to uh, reflect and meditate uh, the business ethics and the notion of justice so when i was planning uh, uh, who can call or who is the eminent person for this topic so immediately uh, father i uh, father came to my mind and i approached him and he happily accepted our invitation and he is with us so on behalf of management i welcome dear father brito and from from his uh, small age i know him very well and he is our lovable brother his brother priest also studied with me and we were very good friends and uh, we uh, we love him so much and he was very energetic and enthusiastic priest and he is doing so much uh, for the people and for the world so now he is doing a doctorate in theology from the university of vienna austria uh, we are happy father to have you as a resource person welcome you father and now i hand over the session to you and please uh, accept our uh invitation and uh, we welcome you father thank you so much god bless you father thank you for the adikalam so as he has just said i know him from a very younger age so he is my brother's friend also a few times so i know him very well so as he So 
father please unmute your father 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 jal bhi to chada kindly unmute yourself now yeah 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 yes father yeah, yeah. oh yes, sorry father. thank you thank oh. you so much thank oh. you sister thank you okay thank you Uh, as far, i thank for adekalam for giving me this opportunity so this is my first ever a webinar or a lecture that i am giving officially in my doctorate time and i know father adekalam from a very young age he has visited my house several times and i know him very well so as he approached me and this also my research topic so i happily accepted he so i live in the city of vienna so it's a city of music so where mozart beethoven all live and it's also a city of philosophy and also it's a city of psychology the father of psychoanalysis sigmund freud lived and taught in the city of vienna or at the university of vienna and this university also has seven eight nobel prize winners so it's a great university also it's a great place to live the last 3 4 years continuously has been rated as the most lovable city on the planet to live in the last 3 years so it's a wonderful place if you ever get a chance please visit vienna so i am a doctoral student i am doing my research in christian social ethics and my research topic is a comparative study on the social vision of pope francis and the ethics embedded economics of amartya sen and its significance to india so this is my research topic and as far as adekalam asked me i was very happy to accept this topic and deliver this lecture so now i go to my powerpoint presentation so are you able to see my powerpoint presentation hello everyone are you able to see my powerpoint presentation no yes you, you have to present uh, yes, brother you have to press yeah Okay, yes, I go as a presenter. Okay, okay, I present yes, now. Yeah, yeah. Present you my entire screen. Okay. So are you able to see? No, father. Please, please share it, father. You'll be having the share option. Share present now. Option. Yes. Present now option. Yes. नोशन जस्टिस See, what is business ethics? See, business ethics refers to implementing appropriate business policies and practices with regard to arguably the controversial subjects, because the practice which everyone accepts that all agree to it. So we need not to have guidelines. So only those controversial practices. For example, when you talk about bioethics. the employment safety or the appointment of just wage and so on so we have several topic to be discussed so that's what we deal in business ethics as well as some issues that come up in a discussion of ethics include corporate governance insider trading bribery discrimination social responsibility and fiduciary responsibility appointment of just wage so the law usually so sets the tone for business ethics discuss so, so as well as some issues that come up in the right the basic guideline that business can choose to follow and gain public approval See, at the outset i would like to make, make a small distinction between ethics and morality so usually so what's the difference see ethics usually connected with philosophy as well as they are guidelines but morality is usually connected with the religion and values and they are morally binding so they are binding values whereas ethics are guidelines so that's why today in modern universities and so on they avoid the term morality they try to use ethics so even lu and where i did my masters they do not use the word moral theology they use just christian ethics 
See, as well as when we talk about ethics, we need to have a well-formed conscience in order to decide what is right and what is wrong. See, for a person who thinks that even like killing a person is okay, so that means his conscience says that's okay, which means that's ill-formed conscience. It's not a well-formed conscience. Again, a person's value system and so on is formed from family upbringing, the moral convictions, religious belief, and basic ethical principle of do good, avoid evil. So these things has to be ingrained in a person, person's conscience, then only a person will be able to make informed decisions in business matters. Now, if I, if I may ask a question, what drives the economy? So from a technical point of view, one might say it's supply and demand that drives Excuse me, Brito. Brito, yeah. Father Brito. Uh, your yeah. PPT is not visible. Uh, can you? Yeah. In the YouTube, uh, your PPT is not visible. No. Uh huh. Yes. How do I go about? Um. John Brito, father. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like no, a, no, no, father. Please share, father. Go to the right. option share and click it. One minute, la. see resume presentation or, but here it's already the screen is shared. It shows. The last day, children. One minute, one minute. There's something now. Shows your entire screen, so that's what. So now you are able to see or hear me? No, Father. Go for the, go for the presentation. Yes, Father. Uh, please click on the John Peter's presentation. Presenting to everyone. OK, now you are able to see? Yes, Father. Yes, Can Father. You maximize it, Father. Can you maximize it, Father? Yeah. Yes. So you, Thank you are able to see and hear me both? Yes, Father. OK. See, what drives the economy? So from technical point of view, one might say it's a supply and a demand that drives the economy. So what drives a person to do business? It's desire, it's greed for money. What is that? The, in the previous, in the past years, even giving credit for interest was considered to be evil, a bad thing, even from the scriptures, from the Bible and so on. It is considered to be evil, but now that's a basic principle of banking, giving money for interest. See, Adam Smith, who's the father of modern economy, economics, is a moral philosopher from Scotland. He wrote in his the most famous book, which set the grounding for modern economics, an inquiry into the nature and causes of the wealth of nations. So it has two volumes. The first volume he writes, it is not from the benevolence of the butcher. Of course, he is writing from Scottish background. It is not from the benevolence of the butcher. The brewer means here yeah, very common as people drink beer. So or the baker, because bread is a common food here, that we expect our dinner, but from their regard to their own self-interest. See, all these people, why the butcher sells meat, the brewer sells any drink, or the baker sells bread, not because they want to do some kind of social service, but it's all because of their own interest. They want to sell these things and make money, make money so that they can fend for themselves as well as they can feed their family. So we address ourselves not to that humanity, but to the self-love, and never talk to them of our own necessities, but of their own advantages. So when they are selling, don't talk them of your necessity, but it's of self-love. So everyone, because of self-love, makes business. So a thing that was seen, a greed for money or desire, which was seen as an evil thing, becomes in the positive note 
with Adam Smith. He gives a term, it's self-interest that drives the economy. So now the question is, how far the self-interest can be socially acceptable as ethical? How far can a person go with an intent just to take money? So can you all hear me? Hello? Hello? Yes, Father. Uh, yes, yes. Yes, 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 Father. Yes, Father. Yes, Father. Yeah. And between, I am just uh, yeah, confirming it. Otherwise, I'll be just talking in the air. So nobody hears me. Yeah. So now, so the unobservable market force that helps the demand and supply of goods in a free market to reach the equilibrium automatically is the invisible hand. So here, again, he just talks about self-interest. Now, who controls this market? See, if everyone says it's just because everyone's self-interest that we do transaction, economic transaction, who controls? So here, Adam Smith uses the device of the invisible hand. He said there is an invisible hand. Maybe it's God's hand or somebody hand that is guiding us through the market force. Of course, so this phrase was introduced by Adam Smith in his book. It's an inquiry, or it's famously called The Wealth of Nations. So it's a small book. Of, it's a, the original book is a two volumes, a big, thicker books. But you can get it into a smaller novel like The Wealth of Nations. He explained that an economy will comparatively work and function well if the government, government will leave the people alone to buy and sell freely among themselves. See, from the Indian context, it's always the government interfering. But whereas in capitalist free market in the West, so they say minimum government. It's always the government should be very less interfering in all our affairs. He suggested, Adam Smith suggested, that if people were allowed to trade freely, self-interested traders present in the market would compete with each other, leading markets towards a positive output with the help of the invisible hand. So he focused on the self-interest, interested people with the guidance of invisible hand, they will trade, so to say, ethically. So in a free market scenario, where there are no regulations or restrictions imposed by the government, if someone charges less, the customer will buy from him. Therefore, you have to lower your price or offer something better than your competitor. Whenever enough people demand something, it will be supplied by the market and everyone will be happy. So the seller end up getting the price and the buyer will get better goods at the desired price. So this is the modern economic grounding that began with Adam Smith. So he was not even an economist, he was a moral philosopher but he wrote the grounding principles or inquired the grounding principles for the nature and causes of the wealth of nations. It seems quite interesting today for us, but what's happening today in reality? Especially in Indian context, if one might talk, if the government does not interfere in many aspects and, and a set norm, mafias, everywhere mafias, occupying various things and only few already in the Indian context when we see it's few people who hold the entire business in the country. Four or five people hold the entire country or control the entire country's business. Is it good for our country, good for the people? Today many enterprises engage in unethical business practices, sometimes even putting people's lives at risk. So here it is that we need to talk about business ethics that business practices are carried out ethically for the well-being of everyone. So now we are going to see two case analysis studies, so which is an epitome, or we can discuss from several points of view, the various complexities of, the, of a business. See, on March 3, 1974, the rear cargo door of a Turkish Airlines DC-10 blew open minutes after takeoff from Paris, killing all 347 persons aboard. So this case study offers material for a sustained inquiry into every level of ethical responsibility, reflecting the rich ethical complexity of actual events. So just to give you a background, see today in the world, there are two aircraft manufacturing companies. There are the two biggest, the dominating the aviation industry. One is Boeing in the US and Airbus 
in Europe. It's a conglomeration of many companies. But prior to 1970, uh, 1970s and so on, there were many companies competing each other. So there was a great competition. And one company that was in competition also was called the McDonald Douglas. So they also were very successful in aviation industry. 1997, it got merged with Boeing, of course. So they had rushed to produce this wide-bodied jet, the DC-10. So what happened to it? Just to watch a small clip, then we come back here. Just for a few minutes, maybe we will not watch it fully. We will just watch it for... It's nine o'clock. Are you able to are you able to see the video or no? Hi everyone. Yes, father. Be able to see that. Yes, you are able to see the video? Yes, father. Yes, father. Yes. Oh, okay. So I'm just confirming it, otherwise, no, just okay.
So, you are able to hear me? Yes, Father. Yes, Father. So, the cause of the crash was attributed to basic design flaws, including the latch and the lock mechanism of the rear cargo door. See, the tragedy of the the tragedy of the disaster was made all the worse when it was discovered that senior engineers were aware of the design flaws in the rear cargo doors and even attempted to warn management of the immediate dangers if nothing was done to repair the problems. Most noteworthy in the case was that the seeming negligence on the part of both managers and regulators to act on the problem, given an identical incident some months ago when the rear cargo door blew open on another DC-10 over Windsor, Ontario. Now, like, I'll just uh, explain what it all amounts to. See, now in this case, there are three stakeholders. One is the McDonnell Douglas, the company, the prime company that manufactured the aircraft. And the second stakeholder was Convaya, who manufactured the fuselage of the aeroplane. Fuselage, all of you understand, I think the main body of the aircraft where everyone sits. So that was the second stakeholder. And third stakeholder was Federal administration aviation with the authority which certifies the airworthiness of an aircraft so these three stakeholders you keep in mind so the first mcdonald's douglas gives contract to convoy a company to make this fuselage so while making the fuselage to close the cargo door previously there used to be two mechanisms one is manually just to close it second with the hydraulics the pilot could control and close it were two mechanisms but now what the dc uh, mcdonald douglas told convoy please do not use both the mechanisms use only one hand closing mechanism that would significantly reduce the amount of money they are investing in it they are investing in it somebody else also is presenting can you hear me yes father be able to hear you sir father. Oh, okay so they, it would also reduce 15 kilo of the entire aircraft, which means it would become more fuel efficient, was the second thing. But it seemed flawed, because they said, when you close only with hand, sometimes it can happen as, it, as it, the video shows. Outside, it would look as though it's been locked, but inside, it's not latched. So that's what happened with the Turkish Airlines. So this is the second, so McDonnell Douglas and second, stakeholder is convoy and st third stakeholder is the authority aviation authority that certified the airworthiness 
even while they were conducting trials see an aircraft to be airworthy to fly it has to several hours of flying test it has to conduct even while conducting a test a cargo door blew off that means there was some defect even they overlooked that so as they said before this accident two months ago there was another aircraft an american airlines the cargo door blew off but when that case came to the aviation authorities the mcdonald douglas company said please do not publish it outside as it's a defect our company reputation will go up so they arrived at a gentleman's agreement what they call gentleman's agreement and they internally just they finished the matter and they sold the aircraft to turkish airlines and around 340 people died so now who should be held responsible for this for this disaster see so many people lied died and lives who should be held responsible do you think the mcdonald douglas or convoyer or the fa federal aviation authority i would say all the gravity of committing this crime i think all the three should be held responsible see the convoyer which made the fuselage gave a report even to mcdonald douglas saying that it's not it's technique it's unfit to fly but they have no legal to the federal aviation authority but morally they did have obligation to inform them. what happened in a, they wanted to save few thousand dollars but in a lawsuit they ended up paying 18 million us dollars and 1997 they had great financial difficulty and now even the company doesn't exist that's why business ethics ethics practice ethical business practice is always better in the longer run for the individuals for the company and for the society at large if they if they acted ethically and fixed that problem they would not have lost the 18 million dollars in 1975 that was such a big amount so it's always good to have ethical business practices in the long run and that's what would help us yeah, i would like to just uh, analyze another case study the ford motors controversy you know ford motors is the second largest automobile manufacturing company in the us and it was of course founded in the us now they are there all over the world now it, during the fall leading in 2018 ford motor company receiving the word about 17 instances of occurrences where the pretentious inside the seat belt mechanism caused fire in the line of f series pickup truck so they have specific pickup trucks f series that's very famous popular in the us they are huge cars and there was fire in the seat belt mechanism so when the small explosion takes place in the seat belt mechanism a gas is released and this gas has potential to ignite from high static and friction of the seat belt contracting and locking in place so this potential risk fire risk is because of insulation and carpet like material in the door and the seat belt area which is inflammable which can burn easily as a result ford had to issue a recall totaling about 2 million f series pickup trucks from the years 2015 to 2018 the 2 million trucks will result in the loss of approximately 140 million in capital for ford the ford has spent 140 million u dollars this recall affected 1.62 million us vehicles and 340000 in canada and 37000 in mexico so almost 2 million vehicles were affected in recall so the ford was ford's action appreciable practical and ethical or the call was unnecessary see because just 70 instances in 2 million vehicles yeah the mishap was tiny in comparison to the number of vehicles 17 uh, 2 million so what should have ford done what do you think each of you watching this talk what do you think ford should have done how do a uh, different people would react to this situation See, for example individuals individual theorists yeah also advocate individualism the theorist milton friedman he won nobel prize in 1997 for economics 
So he says, the only goal of business is to profit. So the only obligation that the business person has is to maximize profit for the owners or stakeholders. So Friedman also believes these profits must be earned in a legal way. So of course, he's a good guy. He goes legally. He doesn't talk about morality. But legally, but the only goal of business is profit. I don't know how many of you will agree to it. See, here, Ford is attempting to abide by those standards. An example would be issuing the recall is lawfully the correct thing to do because the manufacturing mistake is to be blamed. So Ford is to be blamed for this entire scenario. So the right thing is they recall the trucks. So therefore, Ford is law-abiding in the situation. But are they profiting for the company? Because he says the only goal of business is profit, but is this profiting? The answer is no. Issuing a recall is a dramatic loss of capital. See, a freedom milkman is a strong, a staunch advocate of capitalism. So he talks in terms of capital. So it can be seen by the stakeholders or the public as a social responsibility issuing the recall. So your force action taken by issuing a recall have helped them in the longer run. The customers being happy, they will not have to pay for a mistake in manufacturing. So it's like, so he says in the long run, long run doing a legal thing or right thing would help the business. But whatever he says about the goal of business, I don't know, as an individual, as a Christian social ethicist, I would not accept. And I don't know, all of you watching here, what would be your idea about it? And secondly, what would an utilitarian say about this case? The utilitarianism is a family of consequentialist ethical theories that promote actions that maximize happiness and well-being for the affected individual. So here the utilitarians would say, this case is viewed by utilitarian in the sense that they are trying to right the wrongs. So a mistake in manufacturing should not lead to the total decline of the business. But as a result, Ford made the rational choice of issuing the recall because it will lead to better things in the future. So maximizing happiness in future. So now in future. The bad things have already arrived. So the only thing the utilitarian can do is accept the problem and do what will lead to better future. So therefore, Ford's actions in this cause can be determined to have minor utilitarian traits. So what would a Kantian would say? I know, I hope all of you know Immanuel Kant, a great philosopher from Germany who lived in the 1700s. He is most famous for giving the definition of what is enlightenment. If you would like to hear it. So for him, enlightenment is about thinking for oneself rather than letting others to think for you. So it's a great definition of enlightenment. And he's also famous for making the dictatum that making rational choices. So he was a great philosopher. At this time, he dominated the entire world, German world and the entire world, the philosophical world. So make rational choices. So what would a Kantian say? A Kantian would view the situation and make two assumptions. One is we need to respect our customers' needs. And secondly, we need to make rational choices. So in this context, so it's a rational choices for the food was to recall and fix them up and so they did so it's a right thing for Kantian so what would a virtue ethicist say the virtue ethics is a normative ethical theory which emphasizes virtues of mind character and sense of honesty so it promotes virtue ethics promotes a virtual virtue filled character of a person so for them they use honesty, courage, temperance, and justice. Is for virtues are what theorists believe causes business to function properly. So therefore, Ford's action and results from this case can be concluded that they respect their customers' needs and need to make the rational choices for the stakeholders and future customers by being dependable. So for them, it's also them they made the good choice. So. A virtue theorist in this case would have similar actions to the utilitarian and the Kantian. They support ideas of having respect and making rational choices. So now, what should be the nature of business? So, a business or an enterprise is a community of persons with a common good. So, common good should be the nature of business, said Pope Leo the Thirteenth in his encyclical Rerum Novarum in 1891. And Business should be informed by the social nature of property, the virtue of justice, the dignity of work, 
the principles of solidarity and subsidiarity, the common good above all the social and spiritual understanding of the human person. Otherwise, the economy and its corporate form of organization fail to create conditions to develop those within the organization, which was to be claiming that they are serving outside it. So this was from Pius XI in his encyclical Quadragesimo in 1931. Now, so what is the positive side of this modern business economy that we have today? So Pope John Paul II has said, see the business organization that we have give a chance to develop as, as personally the economic fear, just as people develop in political, cultural, and religious fears. See, the role of business in the modern economy puts use of the best qualities that we have as a person, the capacity to investigate and to know, the capacity for solidarity in the organization, and the capacity to work towards satisfaction of the needs of fellow employees and for one's own satisf the satisfaction of one's own needs. So this is what Pope John Paul II says, the positive side of modern economic business. So now, what is the, the unfortunate side of modern business? See, not enough business reach their full potential of developing people, and instead of, instead of developing people, they alienate them. So in the modern economic situation, the business situation, not developing people, but they are alienating people from the work that, that they do and from their personality. So John Paul II describes this alienation in business as the, the maximum return on profit with no concern as the worker whose own labor grows or diminishes as a person. See, for Christianity, the subject of a person is more important. And that's what generally everyone accepts. So a person should not be treated as an object, just as a worker, but as a person who, uh, the, whatever a person does, or the, the production is a manifestation or an extension of one's own personality. So the business should not alienate a person from his work, rather it should help a person to grow. And today people are made use just as instrumentals, just in terms of making profits for the company rather than creating a relationship of solidarity. If, for example, managers treat employees well, not because they are subjects worthy of appreciation and respect, but because it will maximize shareholder wealth. See, this pervasive logic of instrumentalization, which cor with corporate, within corporations today fail to develop the habit of mind and heart to authentically give themselves to God. So that the question that is before us is, if you are a business owner, what kind of business are you running? And secondly, Pope Francis strongly denounces the principle of the maximization of profits as the ultimate purpose of business. So what is the purpose of business today? That's the question that's before you. So what should be the goal of business? The goal of business should be the common good and the human flourishing. We do business, but of course, we satisfy our own needs as well as the need of the society, as well as where everyone flourishes, everyone grows as a good individual. And we wish to grow up kind of person that we value the most. So that should be the goal of business. So Pope Francis tell, tells it is important to work together to build the common good and a new humanism of hope. Promote a work that respects the dignity of the person it does not just look for a profit or production, but promotes a worthy life, knowing that the life of people and the, and the good of the company go hand in hand. Suppose when you treat the people well, you respect human dignity, people it will benefit for the people as well as it benefits for the company. So of course we are saying both. We don't we just say because a business owner invest, take risks and so on. So he also should benefit, but the benefit should be mutual. Both for the employees as well as for the company. So that's what Pope Francis tells here. So that's the end of the first part. So I hope it was a bit of useful. So can you all hear me? Hello? Yes, yeah, can... yes. Yeah, yeah. yes. So this is was what a little see actually it's a very wide topic, but I tried put in nutshell the primary goals, nature and objective of business and the ethical practice in business. So that's what I tried to put. So now we go to the second. So time is running short. I quickly jump to the second part, the notion of justice today. Okay. So yes, are you all with me? 
you are all yes, with me yes, okay yes. okay so the second part oh it shows you are no longer presenting let me okay so are you able to see my screen yes sir okay so the notion of justice today so what is justice the justice is one of the most important moral and political concepts so the word comes from the latin word jus or use meaning right or law the aristotle says justice consists in what is lawful and fair so with fairness involving equitable distributions and the correction of what is inequitable so is affirmative actions with this affirmative actions we can one example in india is the quota system that we have everywhere in jobs and educational institutions so what is unequal we are trying to make it equal through affirmative actions so one of the most famous definition was given by thomas aquinas in his most famous book called summa theology for those who do not know who is Thomas Aquinas is a saint in the Catholic Church. Also, he was very remarkable Catholic theologian and a philosopher. So, he lived just fifty years, but he has produced enormous amount of literature, both in philosophical and in theological discipline. So, Thomas Aquinas defines in Summa Theology justice as the habit whereby a person renders to each one his or her due. or if we may put in other words to give to each one what they deserve by a constant and perpetual will so here we concentrate so what is justice to give one person what he or she deserves so that's what is justice so with the interpretation of what then constitutes again deserving what one deserves being impacted upon the numerous fields with many differing view points and perspectives including the concepts of moral correctness is on ethics rationality law religion equity and fairness so there are many things that are involved in it again the concept of justice the application of justice differs in every culture see early theories of justice the ancient greek philosophical world like plato wrote about justice in his book the republic again aristotle and his nicomachean ethics try to define justice he, throughout the history various theories have been theories have been established about justice again advocates of divine command theory say that justice comes from god so we have nothing to do with that in the 1600s theorists like john locke argued for the for the theory of natural law again thinkers in the social contract tradition argued that justice is derived from the mutual agreement of everyone concerned again in the 1800s utilitarian thinkers including john stuart mill we all of you must have heard argued that justice is based on the best outcomes for the greatest number of people that's a utilitarian so maximum good for the maximum number of people again the theories of distributive justice concern what is to be distributed between whom they are to be distributed and what is the proper distribution again john rawls is a model we'll be discussing about him john rawls used a social contract argument to show that justice and especially distributive justice is a form of fairness so again theories of retributive justice are concerned with punishment for wrong doing so similarly we can go on restorative justice reparative justice and there are many we can there are many forms of justice we can talk about but today the talk of the town or the smell in the air is of about social justice so what is social justice the social justice is concerned with a just relationship between individuals in the society often considering how privileges opportunities and wealth ought to be distributed among individuals so this is we can say about social justice see there is a another friedrich hayek austrian economist and nobel prize winner argued that the concept of social justice was meaningless saying that injustice is a result of individual behavior and unpredictable market forces is meaningless 
So he said that there's nothing called injustice. No, there, there's nothing. He even disagrees. Friedrich Hayek. So now we come to discussing about John Rawls, justice as fairness. He was a is a contemporary philosopher. Of course, he is dead. Um, he was a professor at Harvard University in the U.S. And when Clinton was a president of the U.S., he used to call him occasionally to the White House for dinner to discuss about various issues. He was the foremost political philosopher in the world in his lifetime. He died a few years ago. He's a very prominent philosopher. Of course, he didn't receive Nobel Prize because of philosophy. There's Nobel Prize. And his most remarkable book is called A Theory of Justice. So he used a social contract argument to show that justice, and especially distributive justice, is a form of fairness, an impartial distribution of goods. So that's a, his main concern is impartial distribution of goods, so where everyone flourishes. So that's a basic idea. Now the question is, how can, in the society, we can do impartial distribution of goods? See, because every stakeholder in the society has different interests, and we are biased with many things. So how can we do an impartial distribution of goods? So John Rawls asked us to imagine ourselves behind a veil of ignorance. So that is his device, the veil of, digna, veil of ignorance. How can we unbiasedly, putting away all our differences, we can form a set of principles or set of justice whereby we can do impartial distribution of goods. So the veil of ignorance. So through this veil of ignorance that denies us all knowledge of our personalities, social statuses, moral characters, wealth, talents, life plans, and then asks us what theory of justice we would choose to govern our society when the veil is lifted. Is it? So you leave aside everything, all your mental baggage. And now, so all are in a nil, like, or we call it tabula rasa, John Locke would call it tabula rasa, there is, there is nothing in our mind. And now all of us come together. Then what kind of law that we will make in the society that will govern us? So what theory of justice now you will make that will govern us? We don't know who in particular we are, and therefore we can't bias the decision for one favor. So we will not favor. See, usually what happens, the one who has power, makes the decisions and makes the law in favoring them so here he says in veil of ignorance through veil of ignorance we have removed all the biases so now what kind of decision or set of principle that uh, we'll make so the decision in ignorance models fairness because it excludes, excludes selfish bias so basically we are selfish human beings we want everything in our fair so he says when we are ignorant completely ignorant of everything, then we would make just policies whereby we will be governed. So for this, he says, there are two principles of justice as fairness. He says, these guiding ideas of justice as fairness are given institutional form by its two principles. So it should be, because it should be the so basic guiding principle, so to say, the constitution, it should be the constitution whereby we are governed. So the first principle is each person has the same indefeasible claim. Indefeasible claim means the claim that cannot be taken away from anyone, that cannot be removed, that cannot be annulled, that everyone has per se by law. So this is an indefeasible claim to a full, fully adequate scheme of equal basic liberties. Which scheme is compatible with the same scheme of liberties for all. So the liberty that everyone has, should every individual have. So this is the first principle of justice for him. The second principle is the socio-economic inequalities are to satisfy two conditions. Suppose in society there can be socio-economic inequality. So for example, in a company, the CEO and the fourth class employee are the, the one who cleans and so on. It cannot be equal or cannot be paid equally. So there will be certainly there will be differences of payment. So this can be justified on two conditions. He said, there are to be attached to offices and positions open to all under conditions of fair equality of opportunities. There can be different positions paid differently, provided they were given equal opportunity to study. 
it's the example I'm explaining. There are three persons. We are given equal opportunity to study the top class university, top notch university. At the end, they were taken for interview and given job three different because of their talent. So in this context, there can be any equality. One can be a CEO receiving more money, another can be a fourth class employee receiving less money. It's acceptable, provided given equal opportunity. And second, they are to be to the greatest benefit of the least advantaged members of the society. So there can be any equality, so to say, as long as it benefits the least disadvantaged person in the society. So this is the basic, the two principles of justice as fairness. See, the first principle of equal basic liberties is to be embodied in the political constitution. It should be the basis of the constitution. While the second principle applies primarily to economic institution so it's a very clear so fulfillment of the first principle takes priority over the fulfillment of the second principle because the equality of all that should be the primary principle and within the second principle fair equality of opportunity takes priority of difference of people so equality of opportunity is primary when it comes to the difference of people that exist in society so i can explain it more but we are running short of time so I cut it short here. Yeah. So that was about, so we are only going to talk about two philosophers who defined justice in modern time. The first one was just talk about John Rawls and the second one, Amartya Sen. So most of you would know Amartya Sen or at least I've heard about Amartya Sen. He's an Indian born economist and he grew up in West Bengal and Ravindranath Tagus the ashram so he grew up there and he studied both economics and philosophy and he has taught most of the well-renowned universities around the world including india even he taught in delhi a school of economics and some other universities also he taught in india and he taught at, at oxford he taught at trinity college and even he's also i think currently he's over 80 years of age but still he's continuing to teach at harvard i think yeah so he's a fourth, foremost philosopher and an economist of current time. Of course, he has won Nobel Prize for economics. See, what is justice? What does a just society look like? And what principles should guide us there? These questions have occupied the dominant tradition of philosophy. Everyone agrees, yeah? led by Thomas Hobbes, John Locke, Jean Jacques Rousseau, or Immanuel Kant. And among contemporary philosophers like John Rawls or Robert Nozick, all of us, what is justice? On the contrary, Sen argues that this traditional strain of political philosophy, which seeks to identify a just or a single set of just principles that can be used to design perfectly just institutions for governing the society, reveals a little about how can we identify and reduce injustice in the here and now. See, for Amartya Sen, he has no concern. See, in his famous book, The Idea of Justice, I was trying to look through what's the definition that he gives. He has not given any definition. His concern, only concern is how can we identify injustice? How can we identify injustice and remove them? So that is his, his thing. So Sen developed his justice theory, both comparative and realizations oriented instead of a transcendental institution. So for him, it does not constitute, it does not produce an ideal justice, a platonic concept of justice existing and that we can have know. For him, justice support is imperative. It's an alternative to Rawls' veil of ignorance, Sen chose the thought experiment of an impartial spectator in the face of this theory of justice. So he also stressed the importance of public discussion and a focus on people's capabilities including the notion of universal human rights, evaluating various states with regard to justice. So for him, public discussion is the most important thing. Because when you discuss in public forum, we arrive at what is good for everyone. He and Sen makes a radical breakaway. The traditional notion of homo economicus or rational economic man is motivated by mainly self-interest. We are not merely motivated by self-interest alone. Because we saw Adam Smith telling it's a self-interest that drives the economy. See, Sen articulates in the book, in the introduction to his book, The Idea of Justice, 
that the strong perception of manifest injustice applies to adult human beings as well as to children. See, when we see something injustice happening, we really tell whether it's small kids in the family, you often hear the thing, it's unfair. A small kid saying, yeah, it's not correct. So that means adults or children both have a strong sense of justice. So it's what, what moves us reasonably enough is not the realization that the world falls short of being completely just, which few of us expect, but there are clearly remediable injustice around us, which we can eliminate. So everyone, we know by some kind of intuition that injustice exists, we can eliminate it. Everyone is aware of the bribery that's happening in India or any corruption that's happening in India. We are aware that the injustice can be eliminated. We have a strong sense that children or adults, everyone, the one of sense main arguments is that the project of social justice should not be evaluated in binary terms is achieved or not. So we, we should never say uh, it's justice is achieved, just it's injustice exists. No, we should not do it in a binary terms. Rather, but rather, he claims that justice should be understood as existing to a matter of degree. So justice do exist in the society in a small matter. It could be in varying degree, but it does exist. But so in the continuing process, how can we remove injustice? So that is our main concern here. In conclusion, because it's already we are we have overshot the time. So, in conclusion, everyone agrees there is a need to reanimate the economy. That means it's not only should be profit oriented, but it should be value in, embedded with the values, embedded with the values, and respect for human person, respect for work. All these values should come into the economy. The, the another thing is today what we see is the enormous wealth. One side, we see the enormous wealth, and the other side, appalling poverty. You know, you'd be surprised to hear the most expensive residential apartment in the world. It would be wrong if you thought it's a Buckingham Palace or it's in the United States or, or Bill Gates is holding. No, it's in India, the Antalya, the 27 story building of Anil Ambani. That's just the most luxurious apartment in the world, and it stands amidst the slum, nearby slum. So do you not think it's a scandal in this society where people plunge, where people plunge themselves in luxury and uh, wash their face with the rose water. Another side, it do not have even a single square of meal. So that's today, that's what our modern business has led to. See, what's poverty? You tell me what, poverty is hunger, poverty is lack of shelter, poverty is being sick not being able to see a doctor. Poverty is not having access to school and not knowing how to read. Poverty is not having a job, is fear for the future, living one day at a time. Poverty is losing a child to illness brought about by unclean water. So poverty is powerlessness, lack of representation, lack of freedom, definition, the World Bank. So we must, this modern business must help us to eradicate poverty because poverty pushes, it dehumans us. It takes away the human dignity. So today, wherever any violence ha happens or any unjust situation that you see, do not think it's not happening to you. If you do not protect others or raise your voice against the injustice, be sure tomorrow there will be no one left to protect you or to raise voice against the injustice that's happening against you. So I sincerely thank Father Adekla Sami for giving me this opportunity. So Father, I sincerely thank you. And as well as I thank all of you for patiently listening to me. I hope this talk was of little use for all of you. Thank you. Thank you, Father. Thank you for your wonderful talk on business ethics. And we have uh, one question for you, Father. Yeah. Can we, Father? Yeah, yeah. Today's business ethical gives important only for the money earning or developing the industries, companies, etc. Yeah, see, see, that's the thing that we are talking about. So profit or the institutional, the business organizations alone should not be the focus. So it should be both. See, one side we agree that they have taken risk, they have invested a lot of a big amount of money and so on. So we do acknowledge and accept that factor, but that fact, that's not 
the factor to justify not treating the employee well or paying them less. So we cannot do a right with another wrong. See, for example, some people say we are treating the patients at charity hospital, so to say. We are treating the patients for free or we are treating them for less money. So this is not a reason to pay a nurse less salary. It's not a reason. Either you close down the hospital, that's OK, because it's not your business. It's the government, ultimately, the state's business to provide health care. So you cannot do one wrong with another wrong. You cannot do one wrong right with another wrong. No. You, are, you have to do justice to both the people. So, yeah, so that would be my personal opinion. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much for answering us. Uh, now I request Mrs. Pravina Ma'am, Assistant Professor, PG Department of Commerce, to thank the resource person. Pravina Ma'am. Yes, sir. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Yes, yeah. So, good afternoon, everyone. I would like to take this opportunity to thank Reverend Father John Brito for sharing his valuable speech. Thank you, sir. So, the delivery of speech is very clear. I think it reaches each and everyone. Thank you for that, sir. I would like to thank our management for supporting us to conduct this webinar session. I would like to thank our sister, Reverend Sister Dr. K. Sandhya, our principal, Dr. R. Ruben, our vice principals, vice principals, Mrs. Shamla Alexander and Mrs. Vijay Lakshmi, and our father, who have chosen the best speaker for this topic. Thank you, Father. And I would like to thank my staff members also. Finally, I would like to thank all the participants for your patience. Thank you all once again. So, thank you, ma'am. Thank, thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you, everyone, for patiently listening to me. And I thank for the Adekula Sam for giving this opportunity. Thanks, thank all you, of thank you. Thank you, so much. thank you. So, visit Vienna whenever you get the opportunity. It's a wonderful city. Sure. Okay. Thank, you. Okay. thank you. Bye. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Brito. Thank you, Salman, sir. Now you can give the instructions yes, and about the feedback link also and about tomorrow's sure. uh, tomorrow, tomorrow's plan also. Yeah. Sure, sir. So, dear participants, uh, we had a wonderful session today. And regarding tomorrow, uh, there will be two sessions. Uh, session 3 starts by 10 a.m. Session 4 starts by 3 p.m. So, the first session of the tomorrow's the first session uh, topic will be set your clock to study the practical cognitive in the field of education will be the topic uh, which will be starts at 10 a.m. Regarding today's session, uh, we already pasted the feedback form in the chat box and it will be active only for 15 minutes. So kindly fill your feedback forms as soon as possible. It will be active only for 15 minutes. Regarding if you have any problem regarding the previous session feedback link, you didn't receive your certificate, kindly send us email. We will give you a better solution for your issues. So please mail us. I'm providing the email address also now. HOD.com at uh, St. Joseph College dot AC dot in. So I'm pasting that in the chat box. If you didn't receive your first session certificate, first session certificate, kindly mail us. In case you are not able to fill the feedback form for the first and second, if you have any queries regarding the certificates or feedback links, kindly mail us. I post